great. Well, welcome to um, the ninth session. Hard to believe we're number nine uh, in our series on exploring the Eucharist. And uh, let's go ahead and begin as we like to, as we're dedicating this. I don't know if dedicating is the right word, maybe, but we're asking for the prayers and intercessions of Blessed Carlo Acutis that this time that we're spending together to deepen our, our love, our appreciation, our understanding of the, the Eucharist and the Mass and all of this, just this amazing, amazing gift that God has given us. Uh, we're asking for Blessed Carlo to be praying for us and interceding for us that we may receive many, many graces uh, from taking the time to be present here. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Father, who has given us the ardent testimony of Blessed Carlo Acutis, who made the Eucharist the core of his life and strength of his daily commitments, so that everybody may love you above all else, let him soon be counted among the saints in your church. Through the intercession of Blessed Carlo, bless this time we are spending together in deepening our understanding and faith in the gift of the Eucharist. Nurture our hope. Strengthen our charity in the image of young Carlo, who, growing in these virtues, now lives with you. We trust in you, Father, and your beloved Son, Jesus, in the Virgin Mary, our dearest mother, and in the intervention of your servant, Carlo Acutis, to always be close to Jesus. That's my life plan. The sacrament of the Eucharist, my highway to heaven. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray for us in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. And uh, what I'd like to be able to do, um, you know, this uh, weekend, this Sunday, is the Feast of Corpus Christi, uh, the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and for me, it's uh, particularly special. Uh, when I was ordained a transitional deacon eight years ago, the first Sunday I preached, the first Mass I preached, was the Feast of Corpus Christi. And wouldn't you know it, a year later, the calendar turned out to be such that uh, on the weekend that we were ordained as priests, the first Sunday, my Mass of Thanksgiving was the Feast of Corpus Christi. <laughs> so I have a particular love and devotion uh, certainly for this feast day, very important in my life, um, and, I, and it is in the life of all of us. And so what I wanted to do is maybe just share, you know, one of the, the uh, realities that uh, has been, is very common around the world, even to this day, is the Corpus Christi procession and uh, path uh, video uh, from our path news service from England uh, has uh, wonderful old videos of lots of things. Uh, but I came across this uh, Corpus Christi procession from 1941 from Cork in Ireland. And my father's side of the family has relatives from Cork in Ireland. So I feel a connection. So on the Feast of Corpus Christi and this family connection, uh, they had, uh, I, I came across this video and it's very short, but I'd just like to share it with you because. It's really something that, sadly, I think we've lost, uh, at least in the West, many parts of the world still, Eucharistic processions are, are very important uh, and very popular. So I thought we'd start today uh, uh, with this, a short video uh, from this wonderful Eucharistic procession from 1941 in Cork in Ireland. <laughs> The annual procession of the Eucharist takes place at Bandon with all its impressive religious and military ceremonial. Almost the entire Catholic population is marshaled to join in this public act of homage to the King of Kings. The military escort is in charge of Captain James Smith, the Irish Army Jumper, and the local defence force in charge of Group Leader O'Keefe. The monstrance is borne by the very Reverend J. Cannon Scannell, DSO of the last war, and first chaplain appointed to the Air Army. Altar boys shower rose petals before the advancing procession, 
and a special place is reserved for women wearing hooded cloaks, the traditional costume of West Cork. Through the streets of the town, the solemn cavalcade winds its way to the old church. The ceremony of the Corpus Christi was never more impressive or the worshippers more devout. This year, the participants number over 3,000. It's a big day in the history of Cork. church, our cameraman snapped 85-year-old Mrs. Omani, among the many who had gathered to receive the benediction. The troops give a general salute, and to mark the great occasion, the children busy themselves with the making of grottos. It's a day for the youngsters as well as the grown-ups. ritual is commemorated. Bandon pays her humble tribute to a glorious page in religious history. All right. Well, I liked that so much, but uh, and we're going to do a Eucharistic procession this Sunday after the 8 a.m. Mass through Solomon's. It would be great if I could get everybody to 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 do it and take a walk down the uh, the island, but I don't think I'm going to get that happening. So the Knights of Columbus, um, we're going to get a uh, special truck, um, and uh, after the 8 a.m. Mass, I'm going to have a procession through the church, and then I'm going to come out to the truck, and they're going to slowly drive me um, around the island so I can um, uh, bring Jesus uh, to the island and to bless uh, all the different homes and, and businesses and things like that with, uh, with Jesus. So uh, that will be a very beautiful thing to do. Um, and, and kind of uh, I came across another video I wanted to share, just a little bit, very short, it's like a minute and a half. On really, you know, what is a what is a court? Why what is a Corpus Christi procession? Why why do we do those things? So I'd like to play this video now from Catholic News Service. It's a beautiful thing, I think. For, for believing Catholics in, in this city with the Bishop of Rome to process that whole street with, with the presence of the sacrament. What you're seeing there is Christ dwelling in the midst of this lovely, chaotic, boisterous city. The church believes that Christ is present in the species of bread and wine to the point that he can in fact be adored there. But in order to, to celebrate the, the greatness of such a gift, the greatness of such a presence. The church developed the, the custom of Eucharistic adoration and the custom also of Eucharistic processions on this feast. Mass goes by too fast to get it all. And what, what Eucharistic adoration lets us do is digest that. I loved his, uh, his quote there that Mass goes by too fast 
for us to get it all. Um, and, and that's why it was so important to start increasing the opportunities here in our own parish community for ad Eucharistic adoration. Um, that was one of the motivations for beginning to offer it on Wednesday evenings in the middle of the week that people might have the opportunity in the middle of their of life that can be sometimes very hectic um, with lots of challenges, lots of you know hopes and dreams and aspirations, but also sometimes disappointments and, and sadnesses and, and sorrows. So to be able to steal away some time to be with the Lord for a period of time, to be in his presence, knowing that uh, he is here, that he is here with us, that he's not in some far off distant place. And uh, so that's why we've added the Wednesday evening mass at 530, followed by the time for uh, exposition of the Blessed Sacrament and adoration um, and the Sacrament of Reconciliation to be available as well. And of course, we've also began the first Friday devotions this week. Uh, uh, that will be after the morning mass. We'll have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament until about 1030 um, uh, here as well. So very, very beautiful uh, reality. And I just love this feast that we're going to celebrate this weekend. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really one of, uh, of praise and thanksgiving. That's how we respond with praise and thanksgiving uh, and with adoration. Well, we've got a lot to do tonight. And uh, I'd like to pick up where we left off last week. And of course, we're going to pick up tonight with St. Justin Martyr. And uh, Justin Martyr's feast day happens to be today. <laughs> How about that, huh? No coincidences in the spiritual life. And, um, you know, I'd like to just share a little bit. You know, this morning, um, before the morning mass, I... Uh, typically go over to the historic church and I expose the Blessed Sacrament uh, for the school kids. And usually the, the upper grades come up first in the morning and I give them a reflection or I give them uh, a fervorino, as they might say in Italian, you know, something to kind of chew on uh, while they're there uh, in the presence of our Lord. And today, this morning, um, I was a little bit pressed for time. And so, but what I did was I was so moved this morning in the Office of Readings, uh, in reading of, uh, from the Acts of Martyrdom of St. Justin and his companion saints. Um, and what we basically have is we have uh, a recording uh, 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 of what happened basically in his trial with the mayor of Rome. So St. Justin Martyr, right, he, he starts off, he's born in a pagan family. Right, he born, he's born to a, in a pagan family, uh, but he is somebody who is a seeker, and he spends the early part of his life trying to unpack and come to some sort of sense of of uh, understanding of of why am I here? Why do I exist? Why is there a universe as opposed to not being a universe? Right, all these great philosophical questions, and he explored a lot of the great Greek philosophers and the Roman philosophers of his time, you know, trying to really seek answers to these questions. And finally, he, he's introduced to Christianity. And it's in Christianity that he finds the answers to the deepest questions of his heart. And so he converts to the faith. And because his mind is, is, is a really uh, a, a particular kind of way that can think uh, in a particular kind of way and really has this philosophical underpinning as well. He becomes a great apologist for the faith. An apologist means a defender of the faith, one who can answer questions about the faith, who can defend the Catholic faith, defend our religion. And, um, and he goes in his lifetime, he has a number of encounters in which he is able to do this. And he writes what are known as the Apologies. Um, and uh, for example, so he moves to Rome. He's not from Rome uh, originally. Uh, he's from Samaria originally. Uh, and he lands up uh, moving to Rome. And, and why Rome? Because that's where the great debates were happening. It, 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 it would be kind of like, if you want to engage in the great debates of our time in the Western world today, well, one of the cities that you might consider going to is Washington, D.C., right? This is where a lot of the things 
get talked about and discussed and debated and worked over and so on and so forth. Well, in Justin Martyr's time, that was Rome. If you wanted to debate the great thoughts and ideas of the time, you had to go to Rome, as Augustine would, right, a couple of centuries um, later. And so um, he engages uh, in Rome with a number of of the leaders, including the emperors, who, of course, as Roman emperors, were all, all pagans. And his first apology uh, is about explaining to the emperor about what Christians do. Uh, and then he would even engage with, with his Jewish friends and uh, his Jewish friend Trifo. Uh, we have these documents, and he, we have this called the Dialogue with Trifo, which he basically explains the Christian practices, especially the Christian practices of, of worship. But one of the things that he does is, of course, is he refuses to engage in the public sacrifices of worship to the Roman small g gods. And this is what gets him in trouble. Because at the time, the Roman authorities, and we've talked about this before probably, but the Roman authorities, you know, hey, what you do on your own time, they're not really interested in that. Hey, if you want to go celebrate the quote, Eucharist or do your Christian thing, you want to go off into your home and do it, hey, no problem, you can do it. But what we cannot excuse you from that all citizens have to engage in is the public worship and sacrifice to the Roman gods. Well, it gets to the point where the Christians are saying, we can't do that. And, and so eventually, Justin and some of his Christian colleagues are arrested, and he is put on trial, we might say, uh, before the Roman prefect, the Roman mayor, to use a, a modern term, and his name is Rusticus. And we have the account of the dialogue that happened with St. Justin and Rusticus. And I'd like to share this with you this, uh, this evening uh, as we get started, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how St. Justin helps us to understand uh, how, how the understanding of the Eucharist is growing, <coughs> excuse me, already in the first century there, the second century in the mid-100s, and we'll also be able to see he records for us what a Eucharistic celebration during his time looks like, right? So just a little more than 100 hours, 100 hours, 100 years uh, after, after Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. So here's the account of the dialogue with Justin and Rusticus. The saints were seized and brought before the prefect of Rome, whose name is Rusticus. As they stood before the judgment seat, Rusticus, the prefect, said to Justin, Above all, have faith in the small g gods and obey the emperors. Well, Justin said, we cannot be accused or condemned for obeying the commands of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Rusticus asked him, well, what system of teaching do you profess? Justin said, I have tried to learn about every system, but I have accepted the true doctrine of the Christians, though these are not approved by those who are held fast by error, <laughs> pointing the finger back at Rusticus. So Rusticus responded and said, are those doctrines approved by you, wretch that you are? Justin said, yes, for I follow them with their correct teaching. Well, Rusticus responded, well, what sort of teaching is that? Justice said, Justin said, worship the God of the Christians. We hold him to be from the beginning, the one creator and maker of the whole creation, of things seen and things unseen. Early seeds of the, of the Nicene Creed there, right? We worship also the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God. He was foretold by the prophets as the future herald of salvation for the human race and the teacher of distinguished disciples. 
For myself, since I am a human being, I consider that what I say is insignificant in comparison with his infinite Godhead. I acknowledge the existence of a prophetic power. For the one I have just spoken of as the Son of God was the subject of prophecy. I know that the prophets were inspired from above when they spoke of his coming among men. Well, Rusticus said, you are a Christian then? Justin said, yes, I am a Christian. Well, he said to Justin, you know, you are called a learned man and think you know what is true teaching. Listen, if you were to be scourged and beheaded, are you convinced that you would go to heaven? Wow, what a question. Justin said, I hope that I shall enter God's house if I suffer in that way. For I know that God's favor is stored up until the end of the whole world for all who have lived good lives. Rusticus said, do you have an idea that you will go up to heaven to receive some suitable rewards? Justin said, it is not an idea that I have. It is something that I know well and hold to be most certain. Well, the prefect Rusticus said, now let us come to the point at issue. He's done with all that talk. Gather round then and with one accord offer sacrifice to the small g gods. Justin said, no one who is right thinking stoops from true worship to false worship. Oh, well, Rusticus said, if you do not do as you are commanded, you will be tortured without mercy. Justin said, we hope to suffer torment for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. For this will bring us salvation and confidence as we stand before the more terrible and universal judgment seat of our Lord and Savior. In other words, he's saying to Rusticus, you think you sit on a judgment seat. Let me tell you, there's one greater than you. There's one greater than you. In the same way, the other martyrs also said, do what you will. We are Christians. We do not offer sacrifice to idols. Well, that was it. Rusticus pronounced sentence saying, let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to obey the command of the emperor be scourged and led away to suffer capital punishment according to the ruling of the laws. Glorifying God the holy martyrs went out to the accustomed place. They were beheaded and so fulfilled their witness of martyrdom in confessing their faith in their Savior. Well, what a blessing that we are able to have a firsthand accounts like this so long ago of the earliest witnesses to our Christian faith, those who were willing to not give in to pressure, to pressure from the government in that case, to make a false worship, to offer to sacrifices to gods that don't even exist, and who are willing to die for their belief in Jesus Christ. So it's a very powerful, very edifying, always, this is why we celebrate the martyrs during the liturgical year. Every one of their stories is a beautiful witness of love a witness of love to Jesus, and a witness of really no fear, testimony to hope, testimony to hope in the resurrection of Jesus. 
All right. Well, let's let's get moving along now um, and talk about Justin Martyr as it relates to the Eucharist. A couple of things in his apologies and his writings that he helps us to develop the, our early Christian understanding of the Eucharist. And first of all, very beautiful. He says the Eucharist is the goal of in the incarnation. In other words, the Eucharist is one of the reasons why or the reason why Jesus Christ becomes man. Because in the Eucharist, we have the fullness of the saving events of Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is the goal of the incarnation. The fullness of the saving events of Jesus Christ are made present to you and to me in the Eucharist. This is profound. This is deeply moving. This is an immense mystery. But it is true. And it's so beautiful. And then the Eucharist is the center and uniting force for the community in which the needy receives special care. So we see right off the bat already with Justin Martyr, this, this, uh, this idea of social concern, that for a Christian community to come together for the Eucharist, it's not about just us as individuals. It's then because we are coming together, it becomes this uniting force in Jesus Christ, to then be concerned for the needs of others, most especially the needs in our community. And this will be a driving force in the, and very much in the early Christian communities, which will, by the way, separate them from the pagan communities who didn't have these kinds of relationships, these kinds of considerations, these kinds of concerns. Early Christian communities were very much known for sharing their resources in support of those in need, especially the widows and the orphans. Very, very important. So continuing with Justin Martyr and his thoughts, the Eucharistic sacrifice fulfills all the Old Testament sacrificial acts. <clears throat> in other words, all of the acts of the Old Testament really are prefigure, but then are fulfilled all those sacrifices, all those animal sacrifices, everything, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And then, this is going to be important, we're going to talk about it in a moment, the Eucharist is a memorial of Christ's passion. But we're going to unpack in a few minutes what we mean by memorial. There's another word for it, anamnesis, and we'll unpack that in a little bit. And then St. Justin reminds us that the Eucharist is a cosmic thanksgiving in the sense that the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the source of all life, the source of all being. Uh, and all the universe then is celebrating. All creation is giving thanksgiving uh, to Jesus for the gift of this Eucharist, the gift of himself. So we continue on. Now, Justin Martyr gave us a great gift in that he has kept alive and recorded for us what a Eucharistic celebration in the year 155 AD looked like. And you'll see a lot of similar elements uh, to the way we celebrate the Mass today. It wasn't known as a Mass then because uh, the Mass doesn't come around until really the third century uh, when they start celebrating what they call the the Misa, did you go? Did you show up for the Misa, the dismissals, uh, uh, and, uh, and the, which is what we have in the Mass today? But let's see what he says. On the day we call the Day of the Sun, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place. Well, what's the Day of the Sun? <laughs> it's Sunday, and it's the Day of the Resurrection. Every Sunday, every Eucharistic celebration, every Sunday Mass is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's Easter. Every Sunday is Easter. Then he goes on to say that the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as much as possible. Oh, what do we have here? Memoirs of the apostles. Well, those are apostolic letters, letters of St. Paul, letter of St. James, letter of, of St. Peter, right? And then the writings of the prophets, right? Some of those can be uh, the Old Testament writings in the Psalms. 
So here we have the earliest uh, uh, liturgy of the word, right? So the, how important the liturgy of the word already is. And then when the reader is finished, he who presides over the gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. Oh, what's that? Oh, the homily? <laughs> yeah, here we have a homily, right? Uh, in the Greek, it's omilia. You know, it's, it's trying to help and encourage all of us to grow in uh, familiar discourse with. In other words, in our own lives, uh, to uh, bring into what we hear and, and instantiate uh, these things in our own lives. And then he says, we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves and for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments so as to obtain eternal salvation. Well, when do we do that? Well, it's the prayers of the faithful, right? And when we rise, why do we rise instead of sit? Very interesting. Because when we rise, that symbolizes our joining Christ in his perpetual intercession on our behalf. Jesus is always intercede interceding to the Father on our behalf. And we are joining him when we rise and we offer these prayers. We are joining in his intercession uh, to the Father. It's very beautiful. Then he says, when the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss. Well, it wasn't time of COVID. <laughs> so now that's the sign of peace, right? The sign of peace. And right now we've reinstituted that, but we're calling it, you know, offering a gesture of peace, you know, a way to acknowledge uh, the others uh, and, and that the peace of Christ may be with them, right? This is what it may be. The peace and love with Christ may be with our neighbors. So continuing, he says, then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. What is this? Well, of course, that's the beginning of the liturgy of the Eucharist. That's the offertory uh, procession. And who's he bringing it to? Well, he's bringing it to the presider, the priest, uh, the celebrant. And then he takes them. The priest takes them and offers praise and glory to the father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, and for a considerable time, he gives thanks, uh, and the Greek word is Eucharistian, that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. Um, it's, a, it's really a cosmic prayer, right? The Father of the universe indicates to us that it's a, pro, a, a cosmic prayer that's done in a, in, in the, through the Trinity. We just celebrated Trinity Sunday, right? So it's done through the Father uh, uh, and uh, in the, uh, through the name of, to the Father, through the name of Jesus, and uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And just interesting to note that back in Justin's time, they didn't have the sacramentary, the Roman Missal uh, that I have with the, the Eucharistic prayers. The priest would just free form it. And it was known that sometimes maybe the spirit would really take over the priest and the Eucharistic prayer could go really a long time. <laughs> it could be very, very, very uh, lengthy. Um, but that's what we have here. And then when the priest has concluded the prayers and the thanksgivings, all present give voice to an acclamation by saying amen, right? That's the doxology, right? And where everybody then, you know, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And everybody says, yes, amen, absolutely, praise God, praise the Lord, right? Amazing. And then when he who presides has given thanks and the people have responded, those whom we call deacons give to those present the Eucharisted bread wine and water and take them to those who were absent right so we see right there that those couldn't who couldn't be there for whatever reason at home sick whatever the deacons had the responsibility of making sure that all in the community uh received the eucharist from that celebration on that sunday and we do the same thing uh today to the best of our ability me bringing the eucharist for example tomorrow i'm bringing many uh folks to the eucharist who can't come to mass right now because they're sick or they're homebound um it's really uh to uh share with them the graces and the benefits from the mass that was celebrated uh on sunday 
All right. So uh, thank you, St. Irenaeus. Moving along, I'm going to talk about some of the early church fathers and just some of the things they've contributed to our understanding of the Eucharist. You know, these things just develop one on top of the other. They, this is the way our tradition works, right? We are a church of uh, faith and tradition, scripture and tradition. God reveals truth to us through tradition as well. So our tradition is very important to us. And uh, Irene St. Irenaeus, who was born in Asia Minor, again, in the early second century, he is a, what we might call a third generation disciple because he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Baptist. So he's not that far removed from the apostles themselves. And later on in his life, he becomes Bishop of Lyon in France. Gaul then was known as France. And he was chiefly known um, uh, in his work against heresies um, because what was happening, it didn't take long. All kinds of weird ideas uh, started coming about. And some of them got more of a foundation than they really deserved and really led some people astray. And there were three in particular, three heresies that helped us to deepen our understanding of the Eucharist that uh, St. Irenaeus um, had to defend against. Um, the first heresy, and we still get some threads of these today, especially Pope Francis talks about Gnosticism, that kind of has stayed with humanity through the centuries in different forms. But the first uh, heresy he dealt with was docet docetism. And this heresy was that uh, Jesus as God, well, that means then that, that his human body was only an illusion. And so the people who followed this thinking uh, were known as docetai. Well, you can understand that if his body was only illusion, that's going to affect our understanding of the Eucharist, right? How can you receive something truly and really and substantially if it's only an illusion, right? So that was the first thing uh, that he had to defend against. The second was Gnosticism, and that comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Um, and, and this heresy, there's a lot to it, but what's relevant for us to today really is this notion that God didn't create the universe, um, but that Jesus came to give us, quote, knowledge to release us from the universe, um, that it, it was some way that, uh, that material reality was sinful, material reality uh, was, was, was bad. Um, and therefore, you know, the best thing that we could do as human beings, if we really wanted to have peace, we need to really, it's almost like escaping from reality, right? We need to be released from the universe to attain our highest, you know, uh, state of being, if you will. Um, so I just got to note that my battery is getting low. So I'm going to excuse myself. If you give me two seconds, I'm going to run upstairs and get my, my power pack. Sorry about the interruption. Okay, sorry about that. We're gonna plug this in here and uh, boom. Okay, that's better. All right, then the third heresy was Marcionism. Um, and Marcion was interesting. Um, he came up with this idea that there were really two types of God, that the Old Testament God was this really horrible tyrant um, and the New Testament was this merciful, loving, and saving God. Um, and so Marcion really uh, advocated, and, and he had some influence, that as they were developing the canon of the Bible, in other words, what the books of the Bible would be, you know, because it's the, the church that, you know, develops that over, over the first few hundred years, he argued that no Old Testament books should be part of the Bible. Uh, he was like, that God is a mean God. He's a judging God. He's a tyrant. Throw all those books out. The only thing that should be is from Jesus on. 
And of course, over time, uh, the church refuted that idea. And uh, as it relates to the Eucharist, St. Irenaeus said, you know, the God of the Eucharist uh, is the same God as the Old Testament. You know, he is the God of creation. Uh, he is the God of Jesus Christ. And uh, material creation is not to be despised, but returned to God in thanksgiving. In fact, the bread and the wine that comes up in the offertory procession is meant to symbolize all of creation, right? That we're returning a portion of creation back to God. Go back to some of our earlier talks, right? The early uh, the sacrifices, uh, even outside of Judaism and some of the other cultures, right? They were taking something from material, the material reality, and offering it back to God, right? Uh, and, and early on, it was that sense of getting some type of protection. But um, in this, you know, so that carries through even into the Mass today. By the way, this weekend, we hope to be bringing back, and we will, the offertory procession. We, we can start doing that now because that's very important because that's what it symbolizes. We're taking from what is out in the world and we're that we've tilled with our hands, that we've worked. Um, this is why the offertory is important, right? Symbolically, you know, we're making this, the sacrifice of, the, of what God has given us and we're returning a portion of it to him. So the bread and the wine, the money and the offertory, yes, it goes to pay for, you know, so we can have this parish and pay the bills and everything, but also it's a sacrifice that we're returning back to God in his church, in his mystical body, for the, sust the sustenance of his mystical body, a portion of the blessings which he has given uh, to us. So, um, so St. Irenaeus, you know, yeah, material creation is not to be despised, but to re be returned to God in thanksgiving. Neither our bodies are our bodies evil, but they're destined for eternal life through our incorporation into the risen, glorious body of Jesus. So um, how, how do we, how do we uh, gain eternal life? By being incorporated into the Eucharist. Um, so it's a very uh, uh, important reality that St. Uh, Irenaeus helps to um, defend against these three movements, which are gaining traction in the early church, and he speaks out about them. All right. He talks about the Eucharist as a sacrament of unity, our way of thinking agrees with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist confirms our way of thinking. For we offer to him his own, appropriately proclaiming the communion and the union of the flesh and spirit. For just as the bread that derives from the earth, after receiving the epiclesis of God, right, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is no longer common bread, but Eucharist. That contains that consists of both earthly and heavenly elements. Similarly, our bodies that receive the Eucharist are no longer corruptible since they possess the hope of eternal life. Wow, that's something to meditate on right there. Uh, this is just this beautiful reality. And it, again, it's it, we we have it in the in the creed. You know, we believe in, in life everlasting, right? Well, how, how does that belief come about? Because we um, are united to the one who is incorruptible, right? Yes, our mortal bodies for a period of time will, will you know, return to dust. Um, but our glorified bodies will be incorruptible, right? Uh, they'll be like Jesus during the transfiguration, right? Our incorruptible bodies, uh, we, we will have incorruptible bodies. But it starts now in our union with Christ in the Eucharist. Amazing, What? Uh, how early in the church already, very some profound understandings uh, are coming about. All right, uh, a few more uh, to touch on. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, he's a, again in the late first century. Now, Alexandria, this is in Egypt. This is a major uh, place of of, of study. Uh, they've got the great library in Alexandria, lots of catechesis going on. It's a really a, prof a hotbed of religiosity. Um, and Clement of Alexandria, he, he says that mixing of bread and wine with logos, the word, and pneuma, spirit, 
brings about in the recipient a mixing of their bodies and souls with logos and with the pneuma. Um, so who is the logos? Well, that's Jesus Christ, right? He is the logos. It is uh, the, he is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. And the pneuma, of course, is the Holy Spirit, uh, the third person of the Trinity. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a very, again, you're starting to see these connections uh, being made. Origen, also in the Alexandria area, a little bit after Clement, um, he uh, talks about the Logos too. Of course, this is John's gospel. This is, you know, very much influenced by John's gospel, right? In the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, and the Word, dwelt, Logos, dwelt among us, and so on, right? So Origen says that the Logos is to be reverenced as we reverence the Eucharist. What does he mean by this? The liturgy of the Word. When we listen to the word of God, when we're at the mass, we should be reverencing that word just as much as we reverence the Eucharist, because it is the one and the same Logos. It is the one and same Lord who is present in his word and in his sacrament. A uh, very uh, important addition um, it is the same Logos uh, that is in the Word who, who is in the Eucharist. It is the same Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, drink the blood of Christ at Eucharist and when we receive his Word. So we can drink in his Word. That's why I like to close my eyes. Maybe, I don't know if people notice it or not. It's not like I'm trying to ignore people. Like I, at the Mass, I want to close my eyes because I want to drink in the word of God. Like I want to be just totally focused on the word um, and what the Lord, uh, receiving the Lord into my, into my heart um, so, that that, so that the Lord can be active in my heart, continuing to transform, um, to fill my heart with his life, his love, his truth, right? Shining his light in those areas in my, in my heart that need healing, that need redemption, and those sorts of things. Um, it's very beautiful what Origen adds to our, to our understanding. So drink the blood of Christ at Eucharist and when we receive his, his word. And then moving along to the next century, so now we go into the fourth century, uh, John, St. John Chrysostom, and uh, he is the Archbishop, uh, becomes the Archbishop of Constantinople in uh, modern day Turkey. And he has a number of very profound things. Now, he is a great preacher. He's known as the Golden Mouth, St. John Chrysostom. He was a liturgical reformer. Um, he composed a number of liturgical texts and hymns. And in fact, there is a liturgy, uh, a mass. Uh, named after him, the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. The, it, it, today, it's known as the Byzantine Rite, right? So uh, very beautiful uh, rite, very profound, uh, lots of incense, lots of bells. Uh, so one of the first things that, that is important for us that St. John Chrysostom offers is that building upon St. Justin and St. Clement and the ones who came before him, he says that the Eucharist is anamnesis of all God's deeds, especially Christ's one for all sacrifice, holds an inexistent, it holds an inexistible, inexhaustible power. It is offered at all times everywhere in the world. Well, I'd like to uh, unpack this a little bit because this is really important, this whole concept of anamnesis, of memorial. Now, where does this derive from? At the Last Supper, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. What in the world does Jesus mean by this? It's a memorial, yes, but it's not simply biographical. Because what we're doing in doing this in remembrance of, of me, it's having a direct impact right now in the present moment. So unlike reading a biography of Abraham Lincoln, as great as that is, um, all those events are in the past. Nothing that he did is going to have any impact 
in my life today, right now, in this moment. But that's different when we're dealing with God. It's different when we're dealing with the Mass and the Eucharist. Because in the Mass, the Holy Spirit, who is outside of time and space, is making the memorial present right here and right now and making it active. It is making the saving events of Christ's life present right here and right now so that the sanctifying grace be, can, can become actual grace for you and for me. And there's some beautiful basis for this. Uh, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in the Bible, Psalm 111 is, uh, is beautiful. I just, I'll read it here. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Oh, all of you. <laughs> Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. Think about these words that you were saying, right? Food. What do you think about? Covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be formed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And just one more real quick. Uh, Revelation 15.3 has this uh, concept of anamnesis of the saving the making the saving events of christ present in the here and the now revelation 15 3 and they sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb great and amazing are your deeds lord god the almighty just and true are your ways king of the nations Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. So what's happening is in anamnesis, yes, we are remembering the saving events of God in salvation history, but they're also being made present to you and to me right now so that we can be conscious of these saving events of God in our lives today and right now. And that then in reflecting on those, that then we thinking about these wonders of God, God's gracious deeds, it's called the mirabilia dei, God's gracious deeds, recalling God's gracious deeds in our life and the things that he has done, is doing, and will be doing, we respond with praise and thanksgiving. We respond with praise and thanksgiving. And so there's really four, they call it the fourfold reality. And this is so important because it's central to what we do at Mass. So this remembering, this anamnesis, this memorial, is yes, there are historical events, but they're not stories. Um, they are events in Jesus's life. And these events in Jesus's life, these things that he's done to others, he's doing to you and to me. This historical event has the second aspect of producing a grace. You know, for example, uh, the anamnesis that we use for the example here is on Good Friday, right? We're remembering when Jesus nailed was nailed to the cross and died for us the grace that's being made present for us is that 
our sins maybe have the possibility of being forgiven today, right? That our sins may be forgiven today. We live today. We don't live 2,000 years ago, right? So there's a grace that these events of Jesus's life produce. Grace is for healing. Grace is for forgiveness of sins. You know, grace is to receive Jesus's body and blood and life uh, in the Eucharist. You know, grace to receive mercy, the grace to receive faith, the grace to receive hope, the grace to receive perfect love for God and neighbor. We call that charity. And this grace, these graces, they, they go on. They don't end. They perdure. This anamnesis, this do this in memory of me, as opposed to being some biography of a, a past person, places, or things, is a perpetual memorial because it continues into the present moment. And it will continue tomorrow and the next day until the second coming of Jesus. These graces will perdure through history and time. And how do we have access to these graces? First and foremost, through the liturgy, through the mass, through the sacraments. And then these graces we celebrate. This is definition of, of liturgy. It's a celebration, yes, of Christ's past, of the saving events, but also of the redemptive mysteries that are present in our life today and looking forward to tomorrow, the next day, and the future. So in the Mass, the most, the most clear moment probably for most people when we articulate together this anamnesis is after the, con after the institution where... I say, where the priest says, Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of faith, right? Cry, you know, it is, um, uh, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again, you know? You know by your cross and resurrection, right? You have set us free, right? The, that is the, the central, the whole mass is an anamnesis, uh, all of the Eucharistic prayer is, but the heart of it, where you can really pull it out, is in that moment, our response to the mystery of faith. I wanted to spend some time on this because it's so really, really critically important. And I think why so many people don't get it or get bored or walk away from the Mass or don't get excited to come to Mass is they just don't have concept of this. The early church, they got it. They knew. They really got it. Um, and I saw, also think, too, because they weren't so immersed in secularity as much as we are today. So maybe, you know, even with the worship of the, quote, pagan and Roman gods, right, they, they had this sense of the transcendent. They had this sense of, of this relationship uh, to the otherworldly. Not so much today. So I think that's really important that we try to prayerfully ask the Lord, you know, Lord, help me, help me to uh, come and be present in my mind and in my heart, in my soul, in my awareness of what's truly happening, that the saving, the saving activity, the saving redemptive events of your life that you lived out, that you suffered and died and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for me, all those saving graces, all those saving merits, the power of those events, you are lovingly making present for me at every single mass. When we think about it in those terms, I think it helps to shape and change maybe how we engage with the liturgy, how we engage with the mass. All right. Um, now, just to follow, this is really important because when you move along um, later on, kind of in the time of Luther, even a little bit before Luther, and we'll touch a little bit on it in our last session, there were some controversies that surrounded the Eucharist from this exact point about how the celebration of the Mass, how the celebration of the Eucharist uh, related to Christ's death as memorial and how it was made present. You know, the Protestants in Luther's time, they thought it was actually a blasphemy because they thought that, you know, they didn't have a clear understanding like we have today. And they thought that somehow 
Catholics didn't think that, you know, that Christ's one sacrifice, you know, we, they, they thought that Christ was having to sacrifice himself over and over again at every mass, right? No, that's not what ha what's happening in the mass. It's one sacrifice. But because God is outside of space and time through the power of the Holy Spirit, that sacrifice is, and, and the benefits and the effects and the merits and the graces of that sacrifice are being made present to you and to me today in a way that we can receive them, right? So that's, that's our understanding. And that's what the Council of Trent uh, would go on to say, would, you know, yes, it is the, it is the mass uh, is a sacrifice. It does relate to the Christ, uh, death of Christ. We are doing this after Christ's command to do this in memory uh, of me. Uh, but it it is in no way diminishing the once and for all sufficiency of Christ's atoning death. It's really applying all the benefits and merits of Christ's death for you and for me. So nothing is being added when we celebrate the mass, nothing is added to the sacrifice of Christ. Um, and, and, and when we think about it, it's not just the sacrifice, but it's the totality of his human existence in the expectation of his second coming. So it's the whole Christ, the totality of Christ uh, in his human life and in his divinity. Very, very powerful. All right. A few more things on St. John Chrysostom, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. So he has a lot to say, which is why we're spending a little bit of time. He's a very important figure. Um, he uh, reminds us that sacramental signs communicate uh, to us a communion with Christ so direct and overwhelming that it has to be expressed in language of sense experience for us to really um, uh, understand it. So you know, it can't be, the saving work of, of God can't be experienced just by words. We're physical human beings. We're, we're, we're matter. We're material. We, we need physical manifestations of divine reality, right? And so this is one of the reasons why God gifts us the Eucharist. And then when we do partake of the Eucharist, we are partaking of both of a, a, his divine uh, and human body. So we're already starting to get uh, the threads of, you know, body, blood, soul, and divinity, right? Body, blood, soul, and divinity. So already Chrysostom is giving us this teaching that it's definitely his human body and also his divinity. Of course, at Trent, we'll get the, it comes to the fullness of, of the teaching. Um, and then that in the Eucharist, we are receiving the glorified body of Christ, which is, has his entire history from incarnation to resurrection to, I would say today, add ascension, right? Because heaven meets earth in the Eucharist, right? So not all, it, 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 we're, his entire history uh, uh, we're receiving when we receive the Eucharist, the entire history of his life. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and then we see, touch, and eat what is most precious in the heaven of heavens, the body of the king. I liked in that Eucharistic procession from Cork, Ireland. I know you might have saw it, the banner that says, Hail our king, right? Yes, Jesus um, is uh, our king. He is the king of the universe, which is why we receive him with great adoration uh, and profound respect. Uh, when we receive him in the Eucharist. A couple of uh, additional things that St. John teaches us, uh, effects of the Eucharist. Our disposition is very important as to how and if and how we receive the graces that God desires to give us. If we receive unworthily, St. John, he's very clear in his language. He says, you act like the executioner who crucified Christ. Ooh, right? How important it is to be in a state of grace, to not be conscious of any mortal sin, to not receive the Eucharist unworthily. But then the contrary point, when we do receive it worthily, we partake of Christ and become his very body. One body among yourselves, one thing as body to the head. So here we are already now seeing to this kind of ecclesial dimension 
right? This, this sense of charity, the Eucharist is charity, right? Um, he's beginning to unpack that it's not just my, me and Jesus, but it's me and Jesus and everybody in my community, that we are his mystical body. Um, he talks about the effects of the Eucharist and the action of the transformation of the bread and wine into the body of the blood of Christ in these three dimensions. Ecclesial, everyone is offering it. So when at the Mass, you know, everyone is offering a sacrifice. When, when I'm preparing the bread and the wine and saying the prayers, like everybody can be offering something on that, placing something, you're just using the mind. You say, I'm placing this on the altar. It could be the need of a friend. It could be an area that needs healing in my, in my life. It may be some sin I'm struggling with, with that, I, that I want Jesus to consume in the, in the fire of the love of his heart on the cross, right? But we all offer uh, something, uh, some kind of, of thing we're offering. Um, then th there's the Christological dimension of the Eucharist. Um, Christ is present, um, and he utters the transforming words through the priest who acts as Christ's representative in the Mass. And then thirdly, pneumatological. Pneuma means the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, St. John Chrysostom tells us, who completes the sacrifice. In fact, he calls the Eucharist uh, grace of the Holy Spirit. For it's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, that transforms the gifts and us. Because when we receive the Eucharist worthily, the Holy Spirit is going to empower us to then be transformed into Christ and to live a Eucharistic life, a sacrificial life, a self-giving life, right? This is what it's all about. All right. Um, and then lastly, he talks about the effects relating to, to kind of our Christian social ethics, that in receiving the Eucharist, then it compels us to be thinking about those in need, most especially in our parish first, you know, those who are lonely, those who are in need, those who need a visit, you know, maybe, it's, you know, it's not just always material needs, oftentimes it's spiritual needs, spiritual needs. Uh, and because Christ gave his body for us all, well, then we should be willing to share pretty much everything. <laughs> you know, we, we should have more of that disposition of, hey, everything I have is gift. And it's at, the dis it's your, it's your disposition, Lord. Lord, if you're, if you're calling me to do this with this resource, or you're calling me to do this with my time, or doing, calling me to do this with my talent, you know, whatever it is, Lord, then, you know, we should really take that. If we feel God calling us to do something in that way, we have to take that seriously. And then participation in the Mass and the earthly, earthly liturgy connects us. We're participating with the communion of saints. We are participating in the complete adoration and worship of God. Uh, that is the liturgy uh, uh, in heaven. So he, in a homily that he gave on uh, St. Job, he said that he gave to those who desire him not only to see him, but to touch, to eat, to put one's teeth into his flesh, to be joined together, and to fulfill all desire. I think that's a beautiful quote for us to just hold on to, especially as we enter into this Feast of Corpus Christi this weekend, that we really kind of, you know, just open our, our hearts, open our souls, open our minds to the Lord. Lord, help me. Help me to come to a deeper appreciation of what exactly you're doing in my life, what you're doing for all of us, what your desire is to join us together um, uh, to yourself in the Eucharist and how transformative that can be, not only for our individual lives and families, but for our community as well. Oh, there's an incredible power here. We barely tapped into it. All right. Um, some really good news. Amazing. The last generation, young people love adoration. And one of the things that really uh, I have been just so blessed to be a part of myself is to take some groups of kids during the summer to some of these uh, youth conferences hosted by Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Actually, now they've grown so much 
uh, that they have them in cities all over the United States, tens of thousands of youth uh, going away every summer uh, to spend, you know, three or four days with other teens and other youth from around the country, uh, getting just nourished in the word, spending time in adoration, having great talks and speakers, uh, just helping them to relate and grow in their relationship with Jesus. And this is like a, only a one minute video, but this is just a little taste of what some of our teens are getting to experience today that maybe we didn't get to have as teens, but I think is a great sign of hope for an increase in love and fidelity to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. God loves you and me as we are. He doesn't love us if, he loves us so. He wants to pour his love into us. He wants to say like, I, love you as you are. You are loved. You are willed. You have a purpose and you know it. You know it deep within your heart above all the noise and the masks. Deep within your heart you want to do something great. God has put that in your heart. He has willed you. Jesus died and rose again so that we could be with him, so that we could be with the Father. It's about reconciliation. It's about reunion. It's about being together. Death can't keep us apart anymore. No matter where you've been, what you've done, no matter how messy life has gotten, and let you know that we still have a God, a God of joy that looks at you and loves to be with you. And Jesus, our elder brother, holds each of us with such joy. It's as if he looks around wanting everyone to notice the one that he holds, and that one that he holds is you. So that was a clip from two years ago. They probably couldn't do it last year because of uh, COVID. Um, but that shows you just started at Steubenville. And now how many cities um, that uh, they have these youth conferences? And it's quite amazing. And just the so many vocations and just beautiful things uh, coming from that. So just really a, a beautiful sign uh, for the future. All right, I'd like to just close this evening with a prayer. This prayer is the Collect. Uh, which is the opening prayer for the Feast of Corpus Christi um, on this, uh, this coming weekend. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see all of your beautiful faces who are, who are on. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Well, that was pretty awesome, I think. That was a lot there. Um, certainly. So good thing is we're recording this. So anytime anybody needs to go back and share or check something out uh, that we covered, um, but just, just this amazing, amazing gift. So I'm really excited for this weekend. Uh, I hope you are too. Um, and uh, until then, um, we'll be welcoming and we'll be welcoming Connor uh, this weekend as well. So until then, uh, God bless you. Thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, we'll get together one more time uh, in two weeks. Um, uh, for our final session on uh, exploring the Eucharist. God love you all. Stay safe and be well.